How y'all doing this morning? Y'all doing good? I need a little bit more than that. Come on, how y'all doing this morning? You doing good? As you can tell, this Sunday is a little bit different than every other Sunday. Uh, with that, it's Youth Sunday. It's Youth Takeover Sunday. And so with Youth Takeover Sunday, I need you to, to give me a little bit of room to let service be completely different than it's probably ever been in this building since we've been in it, okay? Today is Senior Sunday, and today we get to honor our seniors that are graduating and moving on to their next phase of life. Uh, we are so thankful for you. Our church is so thankful for you. We love you. We're so excited about the future that God has for you, even though we are yet a little sad that you're leaving. We are just so excited for what God's got for you next. We love you guys. Thank you so much for being a part of youth ministry and rocking with me and rocking with the Trotties and everybody else on the, our team. We love you so much. So just wanted to, if you're a senior, wanted to take this time just to honor you. Second, I wanted to give you a little bit of a uh, precursor or, or like a, you know what they give you on like uh, the medicine commercials? They like give you like that like subscript that's like, a, hey, just so you know, in case you catch this and this and this and that, I'm trying to give you all of that because what you can expect today. So with that, me, I'm what I like to call a hollow back preacher. And what I mean by that is I've never been afraid of an amen, of the, oh, that's good, oh, say that, oh, he preaching. I've never been afraid of someone standing up, stomping their feet, clapping their hands if you like what I got to say. So with that, please do, because I believe that if we have the best news on the planet, the moment that we've said yes to Jesus, everything is different. That if we have the most to live for, we got the best news in the world, well, we should be happy, right? This building and the way we do church should be exciting, not a funeral, okay? So with that, let's have fun today. Let's have some fun today. You know, I, I know some of you in this room, you're, you're seeing me and you're, you're kind of let down. You came here this morning and you're expecting Pastor Kyle or Pastor Terrell, and I'm so sorry, but you got me. And so what I'm going to ask you is don't take any early bathroom break, breaks and don't come back, okay? I need you to just stick, stick in your seat, stay with me here, give me a chance. Because I believe that today God's given me a word that could change your life. I don't get to do this a lot. So every time I get to step on the stage, I feel like I need to invite you into my life a little bit. Just a little bit. Maybe not, maybe not too much, but just a little bit. Me, I'm a Nacogdoches kid, born and raised here. I graduated from Nacogdoches High School 12 years ago. Go Dragons, time flies, oh my goodness. Last month I got married, my beautiful wife is in the front row. Ain't she pretty? Boy, hey, it, won't God do it? I got me a girl that is prettier than me. Whew, that's a miracle, I'm telling you. God still is doing a mighty work in my life, I promise you. But not only that, did I, I didn't just get married, but on the same day, I became a bonus dad, and oof, uh, for some of you, I'm a little upset with you. Some of you people in this room, parents in the room, I'm a little upset, and this is why. No one told me how much of a joy parenting can be. <laughs> and I'm just going to be honest, complete transparency. I have no idea what I'm doing. Please pray for us. Please pray for us. <laughs> Man, I'm so excited to get to preach this morning. I don't know if I got any basketball fans in here. Anybody love basketball, like basketball? A couple people? Not really. I'll be honest. I haven't really been watching basketball this year. I know it's the postseason. I have not watched the game. And you might have your reasons of why you're busy, you got a family now. None of, no, no, none of those are the reason. The reason why I don't watch basketball anymore is because I've been privileged to watch amazing basketball at one point in my life. For some of you seniors in the room, I know you're too young for this. I'm so sorry. You think LeBron James is the best in the world. You're wrong. Um, I grew up watching two of the best basketball players touch a basketball court in the early 90s and 2000s. I was really young for Michael Jordan. However, I was very present and accounted for when it came to Space Jam. All about it. <laughs> but number two, and actually my favorite player, if you see I have a, a tattoo on my arm, it's this number eight. And because of that, it's because of Kobe Bryant. Every time I shoot in the trash can, Kobe, you know, that was my childhood. Every year, it was the Spurs and the Lakers. I was watching the best basketball happen right in front of me. And I know a lot of people, you hear Kobe, you're like, ah, oh, whatever, whatever. He doesn't pass, blah, blah, blah. Okay, whatever. You can be wrong, okay? Um, but the reason why I actually like Kobe is because he didn't pass. And because there's a reason behind why he didn't. 
over the past few years before his passing, he had a lot of these interviews that he would go on. I'd watch him because I was a big fan. And in these interviews, he would explain why he didn't pass to certain teammates even when they were wide open. It was because every morning at 3 a.m., he would get up and he would go to the gym and he would put up shots before everyone else was awake. When his teammates were out partying, they would come home by the same time he was waking up to go to work. He didn't respect their work ethic. And the thing I love about Kobe so much, and the reason why I even have this on my arm is because of one thing, and you've probably heard of it, it was his Mamba mentality. It was his relentless pursuit of being the best player he could be. That no one was gonna outwork him and no one was gonna stop him. And that whoever came across from him, he was gonna give them work every minute he was gonna play. And with that, I took that as a mantra of my life. I wanna be somebody with the Mamba mentality, with the mentality that's not gonna be stopped, that's gonna take life and make every bit of it count. Amen. And so with that today, from that, from that, what I want to do today is I want to give us something to work from. I, I, the title that I want to move us into and the idea I want to work from today is I want to talk about having a promised land mentality, a promised land mentality. It wouldn't be a sermon for me if I didn't tell you to touch your neighbor right now and say, neighbor, go ahead, touch your neighbor, say neighbor. Y'all got to really say it. I'm going to make you do it again. Say neighbor. You need to get you a promised land mentality. A promised land mentality. See, I love that there's a difference between mindset and mentality. I don't know if you know this, but a mindset is something that you have to set your mind on. You wake up and you're like, oh, girl, I had a bad night last night. I got in a fight with my husband, blah, blah, you know, whatever. Whatever it is, I need to get a better mindset. I need to change my mindset. I'm in a bad space. A mindset is something you put on, like clothes. A mentality is something altogether different. A mentality is something that you have put your mind to so many times that it's second nature, that you don't even have to think about it. It is who you are, how you think, how you move, how you operate, and nobody has to tell you about it. It's just who you are. It's what you do. And today I want to talk about that promised land mentality. If you've got a Bible, would you turn with me to the book of Joshua? Joshua chapter 1. It's in the Old Testament. I know some of y'all are a little nervous when we preach the Old Testament, but I'm here to tell you that the Old Testament, it can be fun, it can be exciting, and God can be quite savage in the Old Testament, just so you know. Just even the way he talks is great. Joshua chapter 1. If you're there, say I'm there. If you need a little more time, say, hold up. I'm, I'm holding. Joshua chapter 1. All right, I'm done holding. If you're not there, you can look on the screen. Here we go. Joshua chapter 1, verse 1. It says, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant is dead. Now, therefore, go arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people into the land that I'm giving to them, to the people of Israel. I just want to pause right there. Because, like, I, were you going to act like that wasn't just a big deal that God said? Moses is dead. He dead. He gone. Go. Get up and go. Right now. Go. I don't think y'all understand that this moment is a big moment. Moses has been the sole leader for 40 years, 10 years longer than I've been alive, of Israel. It's just Moses. That's it. He is gone. Over. Done. And God is not even faced. Moses is dead. Now arise and go. We're not even going to pause and take a minute. Like, I can imagine what Joshua might be thinking. God, we just, we just got here. I, like, I just stepped into this leadership role thing. Like, I've, I've been looking at Moses for my whole life. Like, what am I supposed to You want me to do this? God, in this moment, by him saying, now go, it's him saying, my, my plan is not paused. It is not stopped, and it is not changed, Joshua, just because Moses is no longer here. That my purpose on your life is not contingent upon the person in front of you. It's on you. I think that if you get that in your spirit today, that God is not just using people of the past. He wants to use you. It will get you going. Keep going. It says, now arise and go. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I've given to you, just as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness in this Lebanon, as far as the great river and the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea toward going, the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. 
Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all that the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. Sounds like a mentality. So that you may be careful to do according all that is written in it. For then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. You know, I was thinking about this. You know, I just, I, I read the Bible like this. I like to put myself in the story. And that, that, that might not be correct. But it makes it for a whole lot more fun reading. And also, I feel like I can get more out of it. And so with that, I just read the story as if I'm Joshua. I'm not. I'm Blake. But I can imagine what he might be feeling in this moment. God is telling him, hey, it's time to go. You and all this people. Don't you love God? How savage he is? This people. Not my people. What happened to Pharaoh, Pharaoh? Uh Uh-oh. Oh, baby. Let my people go. Ain't no my people. It's this people. (laughs) Joshua in this moment is like, you... You want me to take them in there? Do you not know that we have been here for 40 years because of them? You want me, pause, you want me? All I know is Moses. I don't know how to do this. I got none of the tools. None. none. I, I haven't been the guy. Now I'm the guy? It's on me? And I think... Joshua, in this moment, he's asking us, he's asking God probably the question that we ask him oftentimes when he puts us in a circumstance where we're supposed to step into this future with him that's going to require faith. Am I sure that I can do this? Can I, can I do this? Are you going to be with me the same way you were with Moses? I hope you're, be- you're with me more than you were with Moses because Moses is dead. He didn't even get in. I don't know if any of y'all seen Charlton Heston, I, I, the old Exodus, you know, y'all know what I'm talking about? Anybody, Charlton Heston? All the young people have no idea. Don't worry about it. I love old movies. It's beautiful. I was so mad when Moses didn't get in. I didn't even get it from the Bible. I got it from the movie. Is that bad? I was so angry that Moses didn't get in. I was like, man, all Moses did was hit a rock, bro. What's wrong? Come on, God. It's so funny, too, in this story. They, in verse 17, Joshua goes and says, hey, y'all, God's told me to go. Let's go. Let's get ready. And know what they say to him? Verse 17 says, just like we obeyed Moses and everything, we're with you. <laughs> Pause. <laughs> y'all reading the same story I've been reading because, bro, that you did not obey is the whole problem. So Joshua in this moment is asking, are you going to be with me more than you were with Moses? I need, I need a little bit more guarantees than this. Because if it's just like how Moses got it, I don't want the same result that Moses got. I need a little bit more than that. See, I think for us, if we're going to step into this place where we can answer that question, I can do this and be full of faith and believe every bit of what God has for us, I believe that that promised land mentality is necessary. It's necessary. And for us to start kind of stepping into that from his life, I want to give you some keys that I believe can give you that promised land mentality. I think Joshua in this moment, at the foot of his future, looking into to every bit of what's gonna come in front of him, I think that he needs to have some comfort and some confidence from what's behind him. I don't know if you guys have ever seen the show, but I love this show. I haven't watched any of the new episodes, it's just the early ones. It's called This Is Us. Anybody seen This Is Us? Anybody? A couple people in the room? The thing I love about that show, This Is Us, is, because, is, is that they take this view in present time of these three people's lives. And what they do is they have these moments that happen in the present, and they're so wrapped up and connected to what's happened in the past. And so what I want to do right now is I want to look a bit at Joshua's present reality in light of his past. Because I think if we can see what's brought him to the place he is, we can understand how he takes the steps he takes. Yes? I think if we're going to have a promised land mentality, we have to realize that we've been purposed before we've ever been positioned. 
that Joshua had been purposed for this before he even had the opportunity to get there. Before he was ever going to be the one to take him to the land, God had purposed him for it. And that isn't just good preaching or good theology, it's text. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 17. Exodus chapter 17. If you have trouble, we're going to be in a couple places. We're going to be in Numbers 13. So if you just want to put your finger there, just so you don't have to just follow along with the screen, jump in there with me. Exodus chapter 17, starting in verse 8. Just some context. This is right after Moses parts the Red Sea. They're in the wilderness. The people are thirsty. They are like, God, are you with us? We're dying out here in the desert. We should have been back there. He's, he hits the rock this time, and he doesn't get in trouble, just context, and they drink water, and then right at that time, they're wandering in the desert, and it says in verse 8, then Amalek from the Amalekites came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, come, choose for us men, and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand, And so Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up on top of the hill. I don't know if you know the story of this battle, but in this story, Moses on top of that hill, he raises up his staff, and every moment that his staff is raised, Joshua is victorious. But the moment that his arms get tired and he lowers his arms, they they start to be defeated by Amalek. And so what happens is he sits down, and Aaron and Hur, they hold his arms up, and Joshua is victorious. And that's cool and all, but that's not the point I want to get at. The point I want to get at is in verse 14. If you have a highlighter, if you've got a pen, highlight this, mark this up, because I believe it can change something in your mind. Verse 14 says, And then the Lord said to Moses, Write this as a memorial in a book, and recite it in the ears of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it, The Lord is my banner, saying, A hand upon the throne of the Lord, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. I don't know if you noticed this, but it says God specifically gives him instructions. It's not just, hey, I want you to remember this, tell your kids about it. Write down a memorial, write it so that you don't forget it. Not only that, but I want you to recite it in the ears of Joshua. I don't know if y'all have kids, but I have one now. And the only thing that we recite, spelling words. Why do we do that? So she'll remember them. Why does Joshua need this recited in his ear? Because the battle might have been won, but the war has just started. That in this moment, God has let this battle happen. And not only is it just over, there's a lot of battles left. I think for us, the first problem with this promised land mentality that we don't think about, and it's really funny, I've, I've been around the Bible my whole life and I haven't actually grasped this concept. A lot of times we hear about going into the promised land, we just are like, I made it, I'm here, it's great, promised land, milk flow, uh, land flowing milk and honey, you know what I'm talking about? Just, it's beautiful, it's great. There's only one problem with that. The promised land is not a place of peace. The promised land is a place of a fight. The moment that they step into the promised land, they got to go take it from someone else because someone's living there in an empty land. It isn't just there for them. They got to go get it. They got to go step into the battle. I think the misconception that we might often have and the thing, the thing that gets into our mentality oftentimes is that just because we won a battle, we think the war is over. Just because we've overcome an obstacle in a circumstance, in a situation, we think that peace is the reward. I'm here to tell you today that peace is not the reward. The reward of victory is your next battle, your next challenge, your next thing. And some of you young ones in here, I know that you're just graduating high school, and that's a big victory that you've just won. But guess what? There are so many more along the way, so many that you don't even see yet, that you need to remember this first battle so that you have what it takes to step into the next and then the next and then the next. Joshua in this moment is about to lead these people into a land full of fighting. And he is gonna need every bit of what prepared him from every fight before. That while God had purposed him to do this, not only had he purposed him for it, he'd prepared him for it. 
that it says that he was Moses' assistant, that he sat at the tent of meeting and he watched Moses. Every single thing that Moses did, he emulated. And not only that, he was the one that would go fight. He went from being a slave to a soldier to a servant. It's oftentimes the the space that we get in. We come to this walk with Jesus and we come from a place where we have lived a life isolated in fear and trying to do what we think is going to help us and really we're just slaves. And Jesus, he liberates us and he sets us on the front lines to step out and take ground and have victory in the different circumstances of our life. And not only that, but he also calls us into this place of being a servant, an assistant, to watch him, to see how he works and do what he does. And oftentimes that leads us to a place where we're the one that's in front of everyone else, that we're the leader in the space. I know some of you are like, I've never been a leader. You're a leader, you got a family behind you looking at you to lead. You got a workplace looking at you to lead. You've got a school and you've got classmates and you've got friends that are looking at you to lead. I think some of us, I know some older, I know this is Senior Sunday, but maybe we may need to make this Senior Citizen Sunday, but some of you, believe that you've had your fighting and your fighting is done and it's over and that's a young man's thing. I'm old now. I ain't got any fights left. So old dog, I'm done. You know what's so funny about the story is that Joshua is not a young man when he steps into the promised land. He had been in the wilderness 40 years waiting for him to step in. If the youngest he possibly could be is probably 60 What if I was here to tell you that maybe the best work that's in front of you starts when you're 60, not when you're 20? There's some older folks in this room I'm here to tell you as a young man that we need your fight. That there are young families in this church, there are college students in this church, there are youth in this church that need you to stand up and fight. It's not time to lay down, it's not time to die, it's time to fight. It's time to fight. Because here's the thing, you're the first. You're the leader of the generation. You're the one that we're all looking up to. I know we live in a society and a generation of young people who don't value you, but I'm here to tell you, just because they don't value you doesn't mean that you're not valuable. They are not the ones that determine that you're valuable or that you can fight. God is. And God has called you and purposed you in every single bit of what you've gone through from your whole life. Some of you right now, the whole parenting thing is funny. You're on your second round of grandkids. I need your help, okay? Please. There are marriages that are having just the hardest time ever. We need your help to step in and bring peace to that home, wisdom to that home. Don't you dare stop fighting. You're needed now more than ever. And so with that, I need you to realize that every bit of your life, every disappointment, every hardship, every fight that you've had so far is purposed you for this moment. And God has positioned you where he has positioned you in life with every trial, every circumstance, everything you've been through so that you have the next fight coming. It's time to start fighting. Young people, do not get complacent when you have a, a, a victory. There's more ground to take. Don't become people who settle for the wilderness. Because people have a mindset for the promised land. Yeah, my second point, I'm thirsty. <laughs> my second point today, I wanna pull out is out of chapter 13 of Numbers. The second point, if we're going to have this promised land mentality, if we're going to have this this set mindset to step into the promised land, to the things that God has put in our life to do, we need to be people who stop adding feelings to facts. We need to be people who stop adding feelings to facts. Stop adding feelings to facts. what What do you mean? Feelings to facts. I love this story in the book of Numbers. It's actually... um, Caleb is so funny that Caleb was up here and, and talked. This is Caleb's moment. This is where his name probably originates from. It's from this guy, Caleb. And Caleb has this moment with the people. And we're not going to focus on Caleb. I believe that might come later. But what I want to do is I want to look at the story and I want to pull out this idea because I think it can change your life. Moses hears from the Lord in chapter 13, verse 1. The Lord says to Moses, Send men out to spy the land of Canaan, which I'm going to give to the people. From each tribe of their fathers, you shall send a man, everyone a chief among them. So Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran, according to the command of the Lord, and all of them 
men who were heads of the people of Israel. So God says, Moses, I want you to send these men out to the land to survey and to inspect the land. Verse 17 says, Moses sent them out to spy out the land of Canaan. And he said to them, go up to the Negev and go up into the hill country and see what the land is. Pay attention to this. Whether the people who dwell in them are strong or weak, whether there are few or many, whether the land that they dwell in is good or bad, and whether the cities that they dwell in are camps or strongholds, whether the land is rich or poor, whether there are trees in it or not, be of good courage and bring some of the fruit of the land. Now, the time of the season was first grapes. Did you notice something even what Moses is even asking of them? He's not asking opinions. He's asking facts. Hey, is it good or bad? They big or they little? Big place, little place. Good, you know, like, is it worth it? I need you to come back and give me a report of the facts. Give me the facts. But what do they do? They come back. At the end of 40 days, they return from spying out the land. And they came to Moses and Aaron to the congregation of all the people of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. And they brought back word to them, to all the congregation, and they showed them the fruit of the land. Not only did they have their words, they had a visual representation of how good this land is. They had this big cluster of grapes, one cluster that was big enough for two guys to like carry it on poles. Y'all got the visual in your mind? That big. So clearly it's good. No question about it. No, no opinions about it. It's fruitful for sure. And they say, and they told him, we came to the land which you sent us and it flows with milk and honey. And this is its fruit. It's good. However, the people who dwell in the land are strong and the cities are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there. If you don't know, that's giants. And the Amalekites dwell in the land of the Negev. Y'all remember the Amalekites from my first point? There you go. Dwell in the land of the Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the hill country, and the Canaanites dwell by the land or by the sea and along the Jordan. So you can start to see that they have a little bit of a, a slant to the way that they're telling the facts. The thing is, the thing is, they, they say facts. Everything that they say is correct. Not a thing that they said is incorrect. You notice that? Caleb, in this moment, he stands up and he's like, hey guys, that's all I need to know. Let's go do this. And they're like, ah! hold up maybe not and then Caleb and Joshua are the only two that are like man God has did y'all not see the red seed that just parted do y'all not remember this is not 40 years this is before the 40 years this was yesterday this is last week God ever been so good to you that you forget about it in a week I ain't never been that big that good red sea good my wife might be red sea good but everything else to forget that God's been that faithful okay we can do it God's with us Mm. This is their response. He says, they brought to the people of Israel, verse 32, a bad report. The land through which we have gone to spy it out, it's a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people that we saw in it are of great height. And there we saw the giants of Anak who come from the Nephilim. And we seem to ourselves like grasshoppers. And so they, we seem to them. Not only that, they say, we are not able to go up against them, for they are stronger than us. You know, I think it's so funny that oftentimes we can exaggerate facts. Anybody ever hear a fact, fact exaggerator? Where you just get a, you know, something that happens and you're like, well, that's it. That's the facts. Can't move past them. It's what the doctor said. It's what... The school said, I failed my test. I'm never going to be whatever I want to be. That we have these facts. And I think there's nothing wrong with facts. Facts are just an observation. Right? It's just like, it's just what it is. Facts are what it is. I think here's the problem. We often take facts, these observations, and we turn them into obstacles. That we flavor the, flat, the facts with our feelings. That what they said wasn't wrong at first. It's good. There's difficulty ahead. Thank God they said that. Can you imagine if we lived a life saying there's no difficulty? It's, no, it's a lie. I don't want to be lied to. I want the truth. They tell them the truth. 
But in doing so, they flavored those facts with feelings. And they took what was just an observation and made it a reason why not to go forward. They made it into an obstacle. You know what? There's some other facts in this Bible that I've read that are really impactful for me. You know, there's this fact that Abraham was too old to have a son. But God. There was also a fact that Moses, just before this, had an army at his back and a sea at his front. But God. Y'all want me to keep going? I got more. David was just a kid with a rock. And a giant was in front of him. Fact. But God. Let me go to the New Testament. I got something for that too. You ready? Peter was a man. Guess what men don't do? Walk on water. But God. Paul killed Christians. But God. I'm here to tell you that it's a fact that I should not be here right now, but God. That I shouldn't be on the stage right now, but God. There are things in your life that have been facts. There's things that you have been done that is a fact, but that does not stop the promise of God in your life. I'm here to tell you right now, you need to get it in your mindset, in your mentality, in your heart to say, I might not be who I should be, but I'm not where I was. The facts should have said I was over there, but guess what? God delivered me. He brought me here. I shouldn't have got accepted to that thing, but here I am. I shouldn't have had that family, but here I am. I shouldn't have had that baby, but here I am. But God, you got to stop flavoring facts with your feelings because they will stop you from the promise of God in your life. They'll stop you from the promise. If we are going to be people who step into every bit of what God has for us, we got to be people who are not stopped by facts. Because facts, it's a choice on what you get to do with them. Facts don't have the privilege of drying up faith. Fear does. And guess what? It's a choice. Everybody want to blame the devil for something. Guess what the devil can't do? Take your faith. Can't do it. I'm here to say, if you believe God for something, keep believing. Don't let facts stop you. Because I'm here to tell you it cost them 40 years and the entire generation because they lacked faith. Let's not be people who say, oh, those are the facts. That's the difficulty in front of us. Let's be people who believe God fully and step forward into it. Let's have a promised land mentality. My third point, and one I really, I really love a lot, still out of Numbers 13, I, I think a lot of times when we think about what we can do, what God's called us into, and what we oftentimes don't say yes to, I think a lot of times we make it the enemy or, or the obstacle or the circumstance or the situation being the thing that's keeping us from it. A promised land mentality says, I'm the only person stopping me. That the only person stopping you is you. So get out the way. Y'all not hearing me on that. The only person stopping you is you. How do I know that? Look with me in the text. It says in Numbers 13, right at the end, what do they say? And we seem to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seemed to them. Can y'all remind me what they were in the land? Spies? What's the number one rule of being a spy? Don't get caught. Come on now. They're not supposed to see you. You're a spy. Be, be small, you know? Like, hide. Y'all seen these spy movies, James Bond? James Bond's the only spy that gets caught all the time and gets out of it. This is not the same situation, okay? This is covert spying. This is, this is like Navy SEALs spying. Like, no one's supposed to see you. So, if that's the case, if nobody saw them, how do you make this statement? And we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seemed to them. They have injected their own thoughts about themselves, their own self-perception of themselves onto someone else who never even saw them. That's why it's so important for you to protect your thoughts. Y'all not hearing me. They were the ones that said they couldn't do it. They were the ones that said they were too small. God never did. God never did. Here is the thing in front of them didn't even say it either. They decided. And I know we're in church and we're like, oh, you know, God's supposed to be the one to go... God's waiting on you. God says, I've already given it to them. In Joshua chapter 1, it says, Moses, my servant, is dead, right? 
Take you and this people into the land that I have given to them. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you. That's a past tense. I have given. Now I will give. It's already done. I'm waiting on you. I wonder how much of the things in our life that God is inviting us into, he's already taken care of. He's just waiting for you to take steps forward. I think oftentimes we want God to do something for us, and God's like, it's on you, bro. Go out there, make it happen. Done it. I'm here. And the thing is, they've already seen God come through. They just came through the Red Sea. And he's saying, hey, just like I was with you then and I did that for you now, take a step in faith again. Because I don't think the sea started parting until they started taking steps to step into it. I think for us, we need to realize that God is looking at us to make a move. I love this with Joshua, and I don't think you get to really see it unless you know Hebrew. When God is telling Joshua this, he tells them, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I've given to you, just as I promised to Moses. In that moment, I don't know if you can pick up, it's you, it's, it's weird with the pronouns. This is a plural you, so this is like, I've given to y'all. We're Texas, we're from Texas, right? Y'all, all y'all. I've given it to y'all. I love this part of the change. In verse five, it says, no man shall be able to stand before you. Singular pronoun, you. All the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I'll be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. This is not y'all. This is Joshua. Be strong and courageous. You shall cause this people to inherit the land. God is looking at Joshua and he says, I'll be with y'all, but I'm with you. I will not forsake you. I think there's a fundamental difference believing that God is with us and that God's with me. Here's the thing. God isn't with everybody. He's with those who are with him. Hear me? Do I need to say that again? God is not with everybody. He's with those who are with him. The Bible says that his eyes go to and fro throughout the earth looking for someone whose heart is fully devoted to them to give them strong help. God's waiting on you. He's looking at you as an individual, not as a a community, not as a church, as you as a person. Are you going to believe me for this? Are you going to step in faith in this? Are you going to do it? The only person in your way is you. Stop blaming the devil for it. Stop blaming your mom and dad for it. Stop. It's you. God has given you everything you need to do what he's called you to do. So step forward in faith. You know, I love this. And I, this sermon, I think, if we are not careful, even with that point, we might think that it's just us. It's just on us. And I think that the beautiful thing about this text and the beautiful thing about Joshua himself in this book is that Joshua's confidence and his self-perception is so closely tied to who's with him. Because I think a lot of us can be as big as we want to be. We can be as loud as we want to be about God's using me and this and that, but if God ain't with you, it's powerless. It has the, the perception of strength, but it's really powerless. It looks good on the outside, but it's empty on the inside. You know, I, I love... Um, Movies where the bad guy, you know, is a bully, and the, and the little guy wins, you know, the, the facing the, you know, the giants thing, like David and Goliath. Like, it's cool. It makes for good, you know, stuff, right? But I don't always think it's true to reality. And what I mean by that is, I know some smaller people in my life. I have some smaller people in my life, okay? Some of you might, may not know this, a little bit of my history. I told you I was going to be transparent. I was going to let you into my life. I wasn't always a pastor. At one point in my life, I was a bouncer at a shack <laughs> across from Walmart. I was a bouncer there. Funny to believe that I would bounce people out of there, like, you better get out of here. Like, that was what I did, you know? <laughs> but I had, a, I had a, a friend of mine who was a small guy, and you know, small people sometimes got big mouths, right? Not all small people. Not all small people. Just some small people. And that friend of mine, I loved him very dearly, and he was, he was basically a brother to me. I would even refer to him as my cousin. And what this friend would do is he would get into fights at Shaq. He would just pick fights with the biggest guy in there as if to, like, show his manhood. And little did he know that nobody would ever really fight him, not because he was big and bad, but because they knew who the bouncer was. And they knew that my name, my reputation, my, my, my friendship was connected to him, so they would let him go. And why? 
I hate to tell you, it might be because I beat a couple people up while I was a bouncer, but that friend would always pick fights with bigger, than, bigger people than he should have because he was aware of the person that was with him. I'm here to tell you, it doesn't matter if you pick bigger fights than you're probably supposed to pick. It doesn't matter what you got in you, it matters who is with you. If you have the right person with you, there is not a fight that you will face that you can't make it through. There's not a circumstance you're gonna find yourself in in your life. If you've got the right person with you, it will make all the difference. And I'm here to tell you today, if this is all you walk out of here with this sermon, is that God is with you. If God be for me, who should be against me? He who is in me is greater than he is who is in the world. He who began a great work in me will bring it to the completion in the day of Christ Jesus. You want me to keep going? I got more. God is with you. He's not just out here just like, I'm with you. No, I'm with you, with you. I'm here. Let's fight. Let's go. I've been waiting for somebody to believe me and pick a fight with something that needs to be fought. Because I'm here to tell you today, there's so many fights worth fighting. I think we just back down and are cowardly and we're like, God, fight for us. And God's like, bro, step out. I'll show up. Step out. I'm ready for a church to stand up and step out. I'm ready to be a part of a church that stands up and steps out for people in this community that need to be loved and shown the grace and beauty and life that is, could be found in Jesus. Like, I'm so ready for a church to stand up and fix the things that are broken in our world. Yeah. There are fights to fight. There are fights to fight. So, like, let's stand up and go. Let's stand up and fight. Let's do what's right, even if it costs us something. God didn't tell us that when we stepped out we wouldn't face difficulty. It's part of it. It's what makes it beautiful that the wounds and the scars that we have from believing God in faith and stepping out in faith and real big faith and it doesn't happen the way we thought, guess what? God's got eternity to make it up to you. Eternity to make it up to you. Let's be people full of faith and let's have a mentality that says, I've been purposed for this. I've been positioned for this. I've been prepared for this. Not only that, but I'm not going to let facts stop me. I'm going to let them propel me into believing that God can do things in spite of facts. And last, I'm not going to get in my own way. I'm not going to let my fears stop me from the life that God has promised me to have. I'm going to have a promised land mentality. I pray that that gets in your heart today. As the band comes back up, I just want to lead us in a moment where we just say, God, I, I want to let go of the mentality that I've had. And I want to start putting on a mindset that turns into a mentality that says, I want every bit of what you got for me, and I'm not going to get in my own way. And I'm not going to let fear stop me from believing every bit of the promises that you've given me, that you've given my family, that you've given your church. I'm going to walk forward in faith. So let's pray. Jesus, we just thank you, God, that you were the one that is with us through every circumstance and every situation and trial that we face, that you are the one that empowers us and gives us life to fight. God, I pray that you would so clearly speak to our hearts and Holy Spirit, that you would so clearly just well up this faith inside of us to step out and do the things that you've called us to do. Whether that's love, someone that, that needs help, to go across the aisle in our office and say, hey, I don't know if you know this, but God loves you. And I know that you're going through some hard stuff, but I'm here to tell you that God is using that thing to position and purpose you for something way bigger than yourself. That we get to be people who invite people into a life with Jesus. I pray that we never forget that. God, I pray that you would give us hope for the future, Lord. That you would give us confidence to believe that we can do this not because there's anything in us that's great, but because you are, and because you have purposed us for it. It doesn't make sense to me, it still doesn't make sense that you would use somebody like me, that you would use people like us. But that's the beautiful picture of how you are in your grace and your love. You do what you shouldn't to people that don't deserve it. And so God, I pray in this moment, Lord, that you would lift our eyes and lift our faith that you would encourage us to step into a life that takes ground and doesn't bow down to fear. Give us hearts that are full of faith. It's in Jesus' name.